My Hero Academia Sports Festival was one of the most exciting points of the entire story. It's what got a ton of people into the series in the first place. But now, it's been over 6 years and more than 300 chapters since then. And since it doesn't look like the story has any plans for a sequel, we've decided to do it ourselves. Here is how the UA Sports Festival would go if it happened again today. We've got the same three events. First up, there's the obstacle race, second, we've got the cavalry battles, and lastly, the one-on-one -on -one battles. And instead of having all the students wear their gym uniforms, because they have improved so much and have provisional licenses to work as heroes, they will all be wearing their actual hero costumes. This time around, the obstacle race will be very different. So many of these characters have strengthened their quirks and have developed some awesome new super moves. But obviously, no one has developed more than Deku. He is ridiculously overpowered, and quite honestly, I wouldn't blame them if they decided to restrict him to one quirk or just ban him altogether. But where's the fun in that, right? At the very least, everyone should be well aware of just how strong Deku is, and they might just attack him altogether. But even then, seeing as how he was able to overpower his entire class and break free of every attempt to restrain him despite already being exhausted, this probably wouldn't change much for him. But for everyone else, it makes all the difference. The obstacle race this time around is a whole lot more interesting because it pretty much boils down to a massive free-for-all. Besides the giant robots, massive fissure, and minefield, the students themselves would be obstacles. The first time around, Horikoshi tried his best to be secretive about a bunch of Class 1B quirks, but this time, there is no reason to hold back. The top tier contestants for this event will mostly be made up of characters who significantly improve their mobility and are the hardest to hold back. From there, we'll mostly have characters that make the event harder for everyone else thanks to area of effects or projectiles. Then finally, at the bottom, the characters who just aren't suited for this sort of thing at all. But surprisingly, our winner of the 10 million point headband actually isn't Deku this time around. In first place, we have Ida. This guy has gotten so unbelievably fast that he could probably clear this event a couple of times before most could even do it once. Ida was the only one who could reach Deku when all else failed, and he ran away with a head start. While working together with Shoto, he was able to move as fast as a fighter jet. And although he wouldn't have any help here, he also wouldn't have someone on his back to weigh him down either. I wouldn't already be exhausted. In second place, we've got Deku. With Black Whip, he would be able to slingshot himself off the robots or across the fissure. With Danger Sense, he'd be able to avoid any attempts to slow him down. With Smoke Screen, he could obscure the vision of anyone around him. With Float, he wouldn't have any problems staying away from hazards and wouldn't be bothered by the minefield at all. With Fa Jin, all his kinetic energy would only make things easier, and one for all's raw power wouldn't hurt either. Taking third place, there's Bakugo. Thanks to his Quirk Awakening, he's gotten much, much faster. He probably wouldn't be happy about placing third yet again, but at least he'd be ahead of Shoto this time. And this might be controversial, but Shoto actually is in fourth. Tokoyami is. Because he's in his hero costume, he'll have access to his cloak and be able to fly. This will keep him safe from any traps or hazards on the ground and keep him straddled enough to comfortably use his quirk. Not only that, Tokoyami spent his work studies training directly under Hawks, the fastest pro hero in the series and was the only person under him that could really keep up. Fifth place might surprise you too, because it's Shihai. Thanks to his quirk development, he can hide in all manner of darkness undetected. And thanks to this, the perfect place for him would be with Tokoyami. The only way to force him out would be to have excessive light exposure. And that's the last thing Tokoyami would want, so he'd actively avoid it while Shihai can just enjoy the ride. Pretty sneaky, but if there's one thing that Deku proved with the first race, it is that cleverness can more than make up the difference. Sixth place is finally Shoto. He can spread ice everywhere to make it hard for everyone around him, use it to skate around and increase his speed, shoot projectiles, form barriers, pretty much everything we saw the first time around, but on an even greater scale and with more precision. Not only that, he also doesn't mind using the fire part of his quirk now. That's better temperature regulation on top of shooting flames at people and making it dangerous just to be near him thanks to the insane heat levels. In 7th place, we have Juzo. Thanks to his quirk softening, Juzo can instantly shift the terrain in his favor and against everyone that needs to be on the ground. And because he can swim through it, aside from when he needs to come up for air, Juzo would be untouchable and unbothered by everyone else. Ibarra may be in 8th place here, but in my humble opinion, her quirk Vines is the overall best in Class 1B. It's extremely long range, fast, hard to avoid, excellent at both defense and offense, and can easily capture most people and things. Last time, she came in fourth, 
just below Deku, Shoto, and Bakugo. So that should just go to show how capable she really is, despite pretty much being a background character. In ninth place, we have Sero. And although he hasn't changed much in terms of ability since the last time, he came in first when racing against his classmates after the original hero studies, and is overall pretty well suited for this sort of travel. In 10th place, we have Mina. Her acid has become a lot more potent, and she can use it to skate across the battlefield or destroy virtually any projectiles launched at her. And now, here is everyone outside of the top 10. Moving on to the cavalry battle, this part is honestly not that important. With 42 participants split into teams of 2-4 to four people, there are so many possible combinations that to cover them all would take longer than all of our lifetimes. So instead, we will focus on the reason this part of the sports festival exists at all. It's a fun way to thin the herd and only have the most interesting characters remain. Because Deku, Bakugo, and Shoto are the stars of the show and are all rivals, they each have a team of three others that they take to the final event. And besides them, we have one team of four students that aren't from Class A. So for the one-on-one -on -one battles, our 16 participants are Deku, Uraka, Su, Momo, Bakugo, Hiroshima, Tetsu Tetsu, Mina, Shoto, Ida, Kaminari, Tokoyami, Sero, Monoma, Shinso, and Ibarra. From there, we come up with the most interesting matchups possible. That being said, which poor unfortunate soul has to fight Deku in the first round? Survey says, Deku vs. Tetsu Tetsu. Tetsu Tetsu is durable, strong, and heat resistant, all of which are nothing to Deku at all. Not only can Deku toss around several tons of weight with Black Whip alone, but if he ever actually hit Tetsu Tetsu, he'd have him looking like something straight out of Tom and Jerry. There's really no right answer for who to throw at Deku at this point, but at least Tetsu Tetsu wouldn't be afraid to try. Our next match is between Sero and Shinso. Both of these characters depend on their ability to bind their opponents. For Sero, it's with his tape, and for Shinso, it's with his binding cloth. According to the Ultra Analysis book, which covers things up until the My Villain Academia arc, these two have pretty much all the same stats, except for the fact that Sero is much faster. That being said, in canon, it has been months since then, and we can't underestimate the training Shinso has been able to receive directly from Eraserhead. Although Sero's movement is superior, Shinso was specifically trained to take down moving targets that have quirks backing them up. And because the arena is empty, it's not like there would be much for Sero to latch onto. Shinso is better trained in takedowns and is, by virtue of his quirk, far more crafty. In such a straight-up fight, it might be hard to picture Sero falling for any brainwashing, but knowing how Sero can be, Shinso might be able to fool him if he's subtle enough. Knowing that his opponent is expecting him to try and get him to respond, he might aim to throw him off by not speaking at all. But because he's wearing his costume and artificial vocal cords mask, he could pretend to be a voice from the crowd. It could be one of Sero's classmates heckling him, a warning of an incoming attack, or even a fangirl. If he can manage it, that's an automatic win condition for Shinso, so we will be giving him the win here. The next match is Shoto vs. Tokoyami. They are the primary protégés of the number 1 and number 2 heroes, and rank 2nd and 3rd in the last sports festival respectively. Unfortunately for Tokoyami, there is just no way he wins this. Like his mentor Hawks against Shoto's brother Dobby, this is just a nightmare matchup where his only hope of victory would be an incredibly fast assault that would immediately take his opponent down. And maybe if it was darker, that could be a possibility. But because Shoto has become so accustomed to using his fire now, there is no chance for Tokoyami with his number one weakness being so readily available. And even if he could land a devastating blow early on, Shoto was resilient enough to take hits from Tetsu Tetsu during the joint battles, and stood up to Dabi in the worst of conditions. So there's no way that he goes down that easily. The winner is Shoto. Ida vs Ibarra Ida is crazy fast, but maybe he's too fast. Because we haven't seen him stop on a dime, he might just run the risk of going out of bounds. But if he doesn't move fast enough, Ibarra will manage to cover the entire area with her binding vines, which, as of the joint training battle, are several times more capable than they were before across the board. He could try launching up in the air, but considering what we saw her do to Kirishima in the same situation, that's probably not the best idea. At most, we could say the exhaust from his mufflers might help, but we've never seen Ida make any use of that before, so despite my initial thoughts, the winner of this fight is Ibarra. Bakugo vs Kaminari The biggest change to Kaminari's toolkit would have to be his sharpshooter gear. 
The ability to more precisely discharge his electricity in smaller bursts is a major boon. Unluckily for him, Bakugo's speed and maneuverability make it way too hard to hit. And in terms of battle instincts and IQ, Bakugo is clearly superior. Not only that, but he could easily destroy these things with his explosions. Not to mention, he also has gear of his own. Bakugo actually being able to wear his costume here is a major buff he doesn't really need against most of these characters. Kaminari's best bet here would be to go for indiscriminate discharges and hope for the best. But because Bakugo can handle himself just fine in the air, although Kaminari's discharge can cover a large range, he'd have a really hard time catching his opponent. There's also the fact that too much quirk use could short circuit his brain and make it even easier for Bakugo to win. The winner is Bakugo. Hiroshima vs Mina What an emotional and symbolic match this would be. These two characters have a lot of history. And considering just how impressive Kirishima's defenses are now, Mina wouldn't need to hold back as much in fear of dissolving her opponent. Kirishima is a completely close range fighter, so he'll want to close the distance immediately, while Mina will want to maintain it for as long as possible. Unlike her fight against Oyama the year before, she wouldn't be able to target any particular support items or accessories because Kirishima doesn't use any. The issue here is that Kirishima is effectively an unstoppable force. Despite her best efforts, Kirishima should be able to bulldoze his way through just about anything she can throw at him. Thanks to her increased mobility and superior speed, Mina would be able to avoid him for a while. But eventually, the extended use of her quirk would gradually become problematic for her. Her resistance to her own acid would diminish over time and she'd no doubt approach dehydration on account of Kirishima's stubbornness. But when he does inevitably manage to close the distance or corner her, she'd be able to rely on her Acid Man technique as a final defense to keep him away. Acid Man Alma was corrosive enough to eat through even Giganto Makia's eye. Using it would be her best chance at winning this thing, but it's a final gambit that thoroughly drains her to the point of collapse. And just looking at the effect it had on her eye, she probably wouldn't be able to progress to the next round anyway. If Mina had ever proven herself to be especially accurate or tactical, I would have proposed that she target a particular area of Kirishima's body to corrode over the course of the fight. But sadly, that is not the case. And despite being able to damage Giganto Makia, Kirishima's defenses are arguably superior to that since he was able to pierce Giganto Makia with his bare hands during the first war as compared to Mina's later accomplishment. And the thing to remember about Kirishima's quirk is that it is an adaptive power. It becomes stronger after every fight. One good hit or shove from him, and it would be all over for Mina. The winner is Kirishima. Suyu vs Uraraka These two characters are really close and have even worked closely together in the field on several occasions. They are all too familiar with each other's strengths and weaknesses, so it would definitely be a good fight. Being out of water and on a flat stage, Su would miss out on a lot of her quirk's great features. Her camouflage ability would be major here, making it really hard for Uraraka to react fast enough to avoid her attacks. But sadly, considering the battle conditions, she wouldn't have enough time to sit still and pull it off. And because it's not straight up invisibility, if Uraraka doesn't take her eyes off of her, she'll still be able to see her well enough. Sue is pretty fast, and her leaping ability is incredible. So Uraraka's need to touch her opponent would really make her struggle. And even then, Sue has her paralyzing mucus to counter Uraraka's gunhead martial arts. But because Sue relies on her tongue to attack, Uraraka would just need to wait until she does, touch it, and turn her opponent into a frog-shaped balloon animal. Despite all odds, Uraraka wins. For our last first round battle, we have Momo versus Monoma. Cleverness versus genius. These two are easily the most unpredictable fighters in this entire tournament. Momo can use her quirk to create all manner of things, but with this being a direct battle, she'll be restricted to simple and reasonably sized objects. Flashbangs, smoke bombs, tasers, sedatives, she can do it all. But so can Monoma. He has progressed so much over the course of his first year that all of his talk about Class B superiority isn't just talk anymore. This final event only has three Class B students participating. But thanks to his quirk, Monoma would be able to represent them all. If he so much as touches Momo's long hair during this fight, he'll be able to copy her quirk and start making creations of his own. But although he seems to possess a sort of instinctual understanding of a copied quirk, Momo's creation is a quirk that requires extreme research and study to unlock its true potential. Instead, Monoma wouldn't really need her quirk at all because he wouldn't need it. Due to the nature of his quirk, Monoma has always been considered a sneaky or devious guy. And technically, there's nothing in the rules 
that says he can't prepare ahead of the battle. And thanks to how his quirk is developed, Monoma can now store up to four quirks at once, each with a limit of 10 minutes. And considering how much he's pushed himself on account of the final war, it's possible that those limits have been increased. But we'll stick with what we definitely know. Like we said before, Monoma is able to instinctively grasp what a quirk can do once he's copied it. He probably wouldn't copy the quirks of anyone from Class 1A or anyone already participating in the one-on-one -on -one battles. But that still leaves him with 17 possible quirks to choose from among his classmates. Not only that, but he's been with them for a very long time now. He's observed all their strengths and weaknesses, and to have improved his quirk to such a degree, he would have needed to have done a lot of training with their powers too. Monoma would be the perfect representation of what they can all truly do. Monoma would need to switch between abilities, but the unpredictability and versatility that four well-understood quirks can provide would be too much for even a genius like Momo to adapt against on the fly. And knowing him, each of the quirks he selects will be ones that would really give Momo a hard time by exploiting her weaknesses. Rin's scale quirk would give Monoma access to projectiles, forcing Momo onto defense just like Tokoyami did the year before. And according to Volume 21's extra pages, it can also be used to completely cover the user's body for the sake of defense now. Juzo's quirk softening would make Momo lose her footing and sink, while Monoma can just swim around the battlefield. And even if she decides to toss TNT or something, Monoma can always just surface and resort to Kendo's big fist quirk, which Momo struggled against during the joint training battle. And finally, if all that wasn't enough, he can use Subaraba's solid air quirk to block, push, or restrain Momo, and just about anything she could possibly throw at him. The winner is Monoma. Now it's time for our second round battles. First up, we have the rematch of Deku versus Shinso. Beating Deku in a straight up brawl is completely out of the question here for Shinso. His number one priority, if Deku doesn't just blitz him right out of the gates and end him in 0.2 seconds, would be to get Deku out of bounds. His best chance of doing this would be with his quirk brainwashing, which does work on Deku, but thanks to the hive mind of one for all, that doesn't really last long. Deku, despite being a smart character, can't help but speak up and respond if something bothers him enough which is exactly how Shinzo managed to brainwash him last time. But of course, nothing Shinzo can do here would be enough to win him the match. I'd like to think that knowing how overwhelmingly powerful Deku is, the best anyone could ever hope to do would be to last for more than a few seconds, which if Deku is seriously trying, would be virtually impossible for Shinzo. Deku is obviously the winner. Shoto vs Kirishima We saw just how far Tetsu Tetsu was able to push Shoto during the joint training battle, and despite their similar quirks, Kirishima is pretty much the superior version of Tetsu Tetsu across the board. During the first war, he proved himself to be much faster. They've shared these same work studies more than once, but Kirishima was selected and worked with that gum even sooner. Kirishima's quirk, as we've established, is adaptive and has only grown stronger over time. He can pierce Giganto Makia, so breaking through Shoto's ice would be easy for him. He even tanked a shot from All for One in his prime and was still standing. But there's one thing that Tetsu Tetsu has that he doesn't and would really need to win a fight like this. As durable as he may be, Hiroshima would be like an armadillo in an oven or a freezer against Shoto. Hiroshima isn't especially fast or versatile. He doesn't have anything that could stagger Shoto from a range and would never be able to close that distance. The winner is Shoto. Next, we have the rematch of a fan favorite fight. It's Bakugo versus Uraraka. Between their quirk and skill improvements and the use of their quirk costumes, this fight would be even more entertaining than it was last time. And like last time, Bakugo would almost have no choice but to tear up the battlefield against her. Obviously, the same trick wouldn't really work twice against him, especially since it didn't totally work the first time, but it doesn't have to. Thanks to her hero costume, Uraraka would have access to her zero satellite move and be able to launch any debris as projectiles from any distance she wants. Last time, Uraraka managed to shroud herself in all the smoke and sneak up on Bakugo. This time, their fight might even escalate to an aerial one since she can float herself up and grapple around from rock to rock with her hooks and jet boots. In their first fight, Bakugo could not afford to have Uraraka touch him lest he begin floating up. That would still be the case this time, but thanks to her gunhead martial arts, Uraraka is far more adept at close quarters combat and could really apply some pressure. But even if she does manage to get this off, Bakugo's quirk can act as a propellant, providing him a degree of resistance against his influence. For as much as Uraraka has improved, so has Bakugo, and then some. His costume also negates a lot of his quirk shortcomings, and with quirk awakening on top of what was already a top tier ability, there is no way that Uraraka can win this. The winner is again, Bakugo. 
At the end of the second round, we have Ibarra versus Monoma. Angel versus Devil. As versatile as Ibarra's Vines quirk may be, it surely has its weaknesses, all of which Monoma would be able to easily exploit. Shihai's black quirk would let him completely avoid her attacks and slip into the shadows her vines inevitably create. With Manga's comic quirk, he can use the Onomatopoeia Crackle or Sizzle to start a fire. Using Bondo's Semidine quirk, he can cause her hair to stick together like there's some gum in it. And finally, with Togaru's Razor Sharp quirk, he can give her a nice haircut and break any hold or defenses she could ever hope to have. The winner is Monoma. It's time for our semi-finals fight. To kick things off, we have a rematch and the highlight of the first sports festival. Deku versus Shoto. All Might's successor versus Endeavors. And unlike last time, Deku isn't injury prone and Shoto isn't adverse to fire. Shoto's ice, for as overwhelming and powerful as it may be in other cases, would pretty much be a liability against someone like Deku, who can so easily break through them and turn them into projectiles in his favor. Any broken ice structures could be used as ammo or something for Deku to latch onto with Black Whip. So in this one, it will need to be more supplemental for Shoto. That being said, Shoto's fire is no joke. Having mastered several of his father's signature moves, such as Hell Spider and Flash Fire Fist, not even Deku will be able to comfortably engage Shoto at close range. With temperatures capable of melting steel, durable or not, like Hiroshima, Shoto's extreme heat would be too much to bear for long periods of time. And even then, it would be next to impossible for Deku to breathe in such conditions, severely limiting his strength on account of lacking oxygen. For as strong as he is, Deku does not have a recovery quirk. With Shoto's firepower being comparable to Endeavor's, which can overwhelm even the greatest of hyper-regeneration quirks, one solid hit from Jet Kindling would be too much for him to handle. With all that in mind, Deku would need to depend on Black Whip for ranged attacks and hopefully manage to grab hold of Shoto despite the flames since it's uninhibited by heat. This would force Shoto to use his ice a lot more just to resist being dragged. But with a combination of Danger Sense and Float, Deku would have no problem evading anything Shoto might try to throw at him. This would again force Shoto to play Deku's game and fight close up. Deku needs to wrap things up quickly with a solid hit, and Shoto needs to drag things out until the environmental conditions put Deku out of commission. Shoto's Phosphor technique is the perfect combination of fire and ice. Providing both incredible defense and offense, it can simultaneously freeze and burn an opponent. This would be a nightmare for just about anyone to face. But surprisingly, Deku's saving grace in all this might just be his smokescreen quirk. Shoto has absolutely no sensory abilities. He can certainly try to clear the smoke with a sudden rush of fire or ice, but while he's doing that, Deku would be able to completely restrain him with Black Whip. And if Black Whip can hold back Shigaraki, it can easily hold back Shoto. Shoto certainly fares better than most, but this time, the winner is Deku. Bakugo vs Monoma the two biggest trash talkers in their grade finally get to unload against each other. Things have changed for Monoma. Now that he's the last person from his class still in the running and the others have rejoined the crowd, he'll have access to their quirks too. Inasa's vines are pretty awesome, but they wouldn't be fast enough to keep up with Bakugo's movements or withstand the force of his explosions. The quirk he'll really want is Tetsu Tetsu Steel. He'll need strong defenses to withstand Bakugo's explosions. To cover his bases, Monoma will want to use Rin's scales again. They're not as defensively viable as Steel, but having access to that and rapid fire projectiles would help him out whenever Bakugo decides to take to the air. Bakugo is a bit more ranged these days, but for his hits to really have any sort of impact, he'll need to keep things up close and personal. Besides, Bakugo's not really the sort of guy who'd play keep away. Especially not when Monoma is getting under his skin the entire fight. Managing to lure him in, Monoma would use the additional super strength from Steel to shatter Bakugo's gauntlets. This would make it harder for him to continue using his more extreme explosions. Being up against such an overwhelming powerhouse, Monoma would have to abandon any hope of overpowering Bakugo. And knocking Bakugo out of bounds would be next to impossible thanks to his mid-air maneuverability. Because of this, his only viable option would be capture. Because of how his quirk operates, Bakugo would have no choice but to tear apart the terrain in a battle like this. Seeing how that worked for Uraraka, Monoma would want to exploit the very same thing. Heroes are supposed to be conscious of property damage, so further emphasizing this issue of Bakugo's would be just the sort of blow to the hothead's ego that Monoma would love to point out. And if Bakugo doesn't do so himself, Monoma could pretend to miss attacks with steel for the sake of tearing the arena apart. But the real reason he'd want to do this would be to exploit another failure he'd seen from Bakugo in the past 
thanks to Owase's Weld Quirk. He could merge the heavy rubble with Bakugo's body, weighing him down, and maybe even trapping him. The only reason Bakugo was able to escape last time was thanks to Sato. From there, Bondo's Quirk Semidine could finish the job by gluing Bakugo down. Overall, it's a pretty solid plan, but there are a few issues. First off, Bakugo's timing is exceptional. Steel and Scales are very visual quirks. It's pretty hard to miss a Tin Man and a Scaly. These observations would allow Bakugo to anticipate when Monoma is in attack mode. Besides the copy powers themselves, one of Monoma's biggest assets in a battle is the element of surprise. It's hard to know exactly which quirks he might have available. Waiting for those revelations would be pivotal to Bakugo's victory. Bakugo was evasive enough to avoid being hit by Shigaraki for a long time in close combat. Compared to that, Monoma is not too hard to handle. By virtue of his extreme offense, Bakugo can force Monoma to stick with Steel for the sake of defense and continue to bombard him until he either breaks down or is pushed out of bounds. As varied as Monoma's options may be, no one in Class B has a quirk as exceptional as Bakugo's. The winner is Bakugo. And now, it is time for the final fight. It's the defending champion Bakugo versus the challenger Deku. Right out of the gates, these are two fighters that have no problem being up close and personal, and against each other, wouldn't have it any other way. Not only have these guys fought each other before, they have also trained together extensively for the sake of Deku adjusting to his additional quirks. Together, they trained under All Might's guidance and even Endeavors, not to mention all the times they've worked and fought alongside one another. Suffice to say, they are both very well aware of each other's strengths and weaknesses. Despite his many strides, Deku's mid-air maneuverability isn't exactly on par with Bakugo's. Bakugo can easily achieve something similar to Float, and whereas Deku needs to latch onto something with Black Whip to really amp up the velocity, Bakugo can do so at will with far greater precision. Deku's Danger Sense is bound to be a big aspect of this fight. He was already able to accurately read Bakugo's attacks before getting the quirk, mostly on account of knowing the guy so well. But for as great as Danger Sense may be for him, it is also a huge problem against someone like Bakugo. Understand that Danger Sense may have been a bit too powerful thanks to One For All. Its former user kept away from society as a whole because it was like an unending mental alarm system. Someone like Bakugo that doesn't hold back and has murder in his hero name is bound to set this thing off like crazy. And with how overwhelming and chain reacting Bakugo's explosions are, I can only imagine how overloaded Deku's senses would be. Bakugo's idea of restraint is non-existent, so the radius and speed of his explosions would be too much for even Deku to completely evade. Smokescreen, although it might be useful momentarily, wouldn't have a major role to play here since Bakugo kind of already does that himself with all the explosions. In a situation where he can't see, Deku can't see either. All he needs to do is cut down on any desire to attack and he'd be in the clear. So obscuring himself might save Deku from being overwhelmed, but not really serve to provide him with any openings. With all the movement that's bound to arise from a battle like this, Bajin would be able to store plenty of kinetic energy for Deku to use and bring his physical power to levels comparable to All Might in the past. With the two of them going all out, I doubt their respective gauntlets would last very long. The question then becomes a matter of who needs them more. For the most part, they serve the same purpose. But due to Deku's greater predisposition to his own quirk harming him, we'll say he needs his more. But it doesn't really make too much of a difference here. Neither of these characters wants a ring out victory. It's all about raw strength. And frankly, Deku is vastly superior in that department. Shigaraki's All Might level strength was able to tear Bakugo apart despite being backed up by several other heroes. With Deku being on par with that, the results would be similar. That being said, Deku's defense and health stats are nowhere near Shigaraki's. If Deku were to be subjected to the same explosions, he would be in big trouble. As we saw from Bakugo's delirious yet accurate anticipation of Shigaraki's moves, he is very good at reading his opponents, no matter how strong they are. But I doubt it's on the same level as Danger Sense. Everything else aside, the most troublesome variable for Bakugo in this fight would have to be the once mysterious quirk of the second user, Gear Shift. This is the one quirk of Deku's that Bakugo would have no experience going up against, and that lack of experience would be detrimental. With it, Deku can increase the speed of anyone or anything he makes physical contact with, including himself. He can increase the speed of his attacks to the point of breaking the sound barrier, and do the same to whatever he hits. Combine that with Ba Jin, Float, Black Whip, or even just the raw power of One For All, and you are looking at unfathomable levels of strength. Not only that, and because Gear Shift operates on the molecular level, Deku's perception becomes inconceivably heightened. The combination of that and Danger Sense would make harming him virtually impossible for Bakugo. Because of all this, 
victory in a one-on-one -on -one fight against him just could not happen if Deku actually tries. The winner of the second sports festival is Deku. As always, I'm Slice of Otaku. Thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.